thank you very much, uh, Roland, and thank you to the center and, and to the university. And it, it's a, a great pleasure to come back to Ottawa from Toronto, where I'm now based, um, and to uh, address a crowd that is um, very pleasantly full of uh, family and, and friends and, and colleagues. In other words, a, a, a very tough crowd um, and, a, and a very knowledgeable one about the topics I'll be speaking about. So um, uh, it's an honor and a challenge to do this. The book, uh, I'm, and you'll find this out soon enough, I'm not a sinologist by any stretch of the imagination. It, it's, it's a book about two places, not one place. It's a book about a middle power and a middle kingdom. It's a Canada-China book. And it comes from my own reflection, and I, I, I left government service in, in 2012 uh, on my life's work. It's very natural at the end of your career to think about um, the, the path or the trajectory that um, that work is on. And retiring after 32 years, I asked myself if I could say that our foreign policy uh, was more capable and effective, and particularly in relation to that hugely important country that's been at the center of my professional life. And I was haunted by a, a quote that I had seen some years before I retired um, in uh, Peter Hennessy's uh, wonderful book about public service in Britain called Whitehall. And early in the book, Hennessy has a quote that, as I say, stuck in my memory and not in the nice way. It was, it's not much fun in your Indian summer to have to endure well-publicized claims that you have presided over 30 years of failure and that nothing short of a transfusion of new blood and new methods will suffice if your country is to survive the results of your life's work. <laughs> I did have a sense uh, that as much as I'd had a chance to contribute with wonderful colleagues, things weren't exactly on the right track and I couldn't uh, absolve myself uh, entirely of responsibility as much as I tried. And sitting down and thinking about the book and talking to Canadians and thinking about the Canada-China relationship was my approach at accounting for this or trying to, trying to explain why we're on the track we're on and, and trying to offer up some ideas for how we might get off it on a, onto a better, uh, a better track. As I say, my career has um, largely been spent watching China rise to global power and influence over the last 30 years. That steady rise has been uh, both a byproduct and a shaper of a changing world order, one that has significant consequences for Canada. Simply and briefly put, we're witnessing the emergence of a world in which how we do foreign policy matters a great deal more than it did even a decade ago. So we need to think of foreign policy in much more ambitious and existential terms. When I speak of foreign policy, I don't just mean the occasional and entirely discretionary deployment of diplomats, aid dollars, or F-18s, as our contribution to the la latest international crisis, an intervention motivated largely by our sense of duty, whose duration is entirely determined by us, and one whose lessons we're free, and very likely, to ignore. I mean instead the clear-eyed, dispassionate, and to a certain extent self-interested navigation through a changing international scene, the smart and connected management of those things we can manage, so that we maximize the upside and minimize the downside of a world order that is much more challenging to us, but one that also offers us new and exciting possibilities. It's a world order that has China very near its center. Another way of saying this is that getting the relationship with China right is in many respects central to our future prosperity, security, and well-being. And I come in the book to the somewhat gloomy conclusion that we're far from ready to do that. I've spent the three years since I left Beijing thinking about the relationship, how it's developing, where it's going, thinking about China's very mixed impact on us, and whether we actually aspire to manage it as a foreign policy challenge for the future. What's really interesting to me is that we engage China, or are being engaged by China, on two planes. There is a traditional, official, diplomatic relationship with Ottawa and Beijing as the two poles, but there's also a lot happening at the personal level, at street level. Both are worthy of attention, and both are susceptible to smart policy responses. At the official level, to paraphrase a, a wise uh, Australian diplomat whose reports I once read, he said of Australia, well, we may not have a China policy. It's pretty evident that China has an Australia policy, and I'd say, 
The same thing is true for Canada. It's pretty evident that China has a Canada policy. And if we think of things like the engagement of uh, China's uh, state-owned enterprises, their interest in investment in, in Canada, to a certain extent that is, it has a state dimension to it. If we think of China's efforts at soft power promotion, including the encouragement of the establishment of Confucius Institutes in, in Canada. Um, if we think of uh, cyber espionage or interference in Canadian society. When I think back as, uh, at how I was managed as a, a diplomat in Beijing by a China that was very thoughtful and very careful about the daily messages that it wanted to send to Canada, it was evident that China did have a, a, a Canada strategy. And when you think about it, China's engagement is, of us is, a, to a certain extent, a tiny sliver of China's larger regional, multilateral, and increasingly global activism, except that we don't think about it much. Ours is a policy of fits and starts. And I'm, I was reminded, and in the book I mentioned this, of our approach to China after uh, a, a gradual re-engagement starting in 2008, 2009, culminating in a highly successful visit by uh, Prime Minister Harper in early 2012, the Chinese uh, uh, quite excited about possibilities uh, and, and really uh, in, in an uncharacteristically um, uh, engaging way offering us things like the start of free trade negotiations and then Canada suddenly going silent and completely silent. And the, the memory that that conjured up for me is having read in my history of the uh, great Mongol army that approached the gates of Vienna in 1241 all of Europe was ready for the taking and they mysteriously melted back into, into Asia. For them, the excuse was the death of the great Khan. I'm not quite sure why we stopped at the gates of Beijing, but we did. If our formal official relationship is marked by a disinclination on our part to see it steadily and see it whole, it's even more true in relation to that great outpouring of enthusiasm and personal energy being released by Chinese students, tourists, and emigrants eager to discover Canada. It's having a very powerful impact right across the country, but we're not spending much time thinking about how to maximize the upside and minimize some of the possible downsides of such powerful global trends. I spend some time in the book talking about these people-to-people -people trends, and let me break them down. Education is one, and at the embassy I spent a great deal of my time thinking about Canada-China educational linkages and promoting education. And I think to a large extent, we're, we're, we've been on the right track, and, and it's very gratifying to see that Chinese students represent about a third of our international student population. But it's too easy for us and too much of a cliche to think of things and to say things like education is an export. It is an export to a certain extent, and it's part of our services trade, but it's much, much more than that. And we need to be sure, and those institutions are succeeding, that whose relationship with Chinese students starts when they come to Canada. It doesn't end when the first uh, tuition check clears. And I, I've spent time, every time I'd come back to Canada as ambassador, I'd stop at another Canadian university. And I, I found places like uh, Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, where the whole community has come around and welcomed their Chinese students, made them feel at home, welcomed them into their society. That's a great example of how we should be approaching this. Um, University of Toronto Scarborough has a very successful uh, program in the summer to help Chinese students understand how Toronto works, which, uh, as you can imagine, is not always easy, and welcoming, welcoming them into the university community, but also into the larger part of that, uh, that city where they live. So thinking about student experience is important. I also used to speak to Chinese students at least once a month. And invariably in the Q&A session, I was asking them how they found things, how the visa experience had been, where they wanted to go in Canada. There'd always be one nervous student who'd, who'd raise his hand or her hand and ask the question that they were all waiting for, and that had to do with Canadian winter. And I had to admit, I didn't think I could get away with it unless I was speaking about, you know, the uh, UVic. Um, that in fact, winter seems to be uh, a regular fact of Canadian life, but that most of us survive it. And we uh, talked our way through some of the challenges that winter poses. And I remember one young woman who was very honest with me, and she said, look, I was accepted at McMaster University, but I was so worried about winter that I, instead I, I took the offer I got from the U.S. And I said, where was that? And she said, SUNY Buffalo. <laughs> so, but the other side of, uh, of, of education is thinking about the outbound 
voyage of Canadian students, and I worked on a project last year on, on Canada's Asia competence. How are we doing preparing Canadians for a future in which Asia will be steadily more, more important? And I found that there's still just a trickle of students in the other direction. You know, President Obama visited China in 2009 as well, and it was a pretty unsatisfactory visit. The Chinese were feeling their oats, they were feeling confident, and they treated him uh, with uncharacteristic coolness and a degree of disdain. And the only real success of that visit was when Obama proclaimed what came to be known as the 100,000 Strong Initiative. And he said, over the next four years, I'd like to see 100,000 Americans travel to China for their studies. And so he's using the bully pulpit of the presidency to give permission to uh, students to do something that is that uh, challenging and that uh, uh, out of the ordinary. And in fact, the Americans have succeeded in doing just that. We need something similar. We need to think of education more truly as a two-way street. I spent a lot of time thinking about tourism. Chinese are now uh, the, the most numerous tourists in the world and the most free spending. And we got back into the tourism business with China in, in 2009. And it's having an Im a mixed impact across the country. Some places get it. And I, I made sure that I traveled to the two bucket list destinations for Chinese travelers. One of them is, not surprisingly, Niagara Falls. The other is Butchart Gardens out in Victoria. And if you're Chinese and come to Canada, you've got to have the t-shirt that says Butchart Gardens. And what's really interesting is both places, in Niagara Falls and, and in Victoria, or just outside of Victoria, when I talk to people, they're thinking really carefully about things. And these are sort of no-brainers, like providing service in Chinese and hiring talented uh, students who speak Chinese to, to work in the gift shops and the restaurants. Uh, they're thinking about what kind of an experience Chinese tourists like to have, what they like to buy, and most importantly, uh, what Chinese tourists like to eat. They're changing the menu. And, and the, the cha that chapter heading is called Breaking the Breakfast Barrier, because I think that breakfast is the uncrossable cultural divide. We're sleepy and, and we're in need of comfort. And if you go to a hotel in China and you see the Chinese breakfast and Western breakfast, there's a pretty significant breakdown. You don't see many people crossing the breakfast divide. So those Canadian uh, tourism venues that are willing to, to cross the divide uh, to think about uh, what Chinese tourists want. And we're, we're seeing rapid change from t China being a, uh, a place predominate, where, where it's predominantly tour groups to high net worth solo individuals who want an experience of Canada. Those people, those destinations, wherever they are in Canada who are thinking about this are, are doing very well. I also spent some time talking about migration and trying to understand uh, what's happening in terms of real estate in places like uh, Vancouver and Toronto. This is a really interesting uh, issue because it's not very well understood. You have one body of opinion that says uh, foreign investment in real estate has no impact whatsoever. And that's dominated, not surprisingly, by people who are in the real estate business. But there are other people who say, no, it, it's going to have some impact. And, and these are urban planners and, and you know, uh, people who study urban affairs who say, and I think this is true, that what we're seeing is a global phenomenon where people who have a lot of money are interested in the term that uh, a guy named Andy Yan, who's an urban planner in Vancouver, used is they're, they're parking it in desirable locations. It doesn't matter whether the source of that money is Calgary or Shanghai or Moscow or uh, the UAE. But he said, we need to think a little bit about the parking rules. And I think what's happening in Vancouver, although I can't point to the statistics because we don't have the st statistics, is that a lot of that money is coming into a very limited market. And uh, observers as eminent as The Economist have found that the Vancouver market, real estate market, is becoming delinked from the Vancouver economy. And that becomes a pol public policy question. And it's one that behooves uh, a debate. It, it behooves some kind of understanding of this global phenomenon. And an interest in the smart policy responses that places like Sydney and London and San Francisco are thinking about to maximize the upside, to be as welcoming as possible, but also to think about the unintended consequences of that much cash flowing in from around the world. And finally, when the cash comes from China, and China is regrettably the number one source of hot money in the world, there is a tremendous problem in China with corrupt officials absconding with money and ending up in countries like Canada. We also have to be a little bit more curious than we've been about where the money comes from, and it's probably not something that we should leave entirely to the real estate industry to police. Now, I'm not casting aspersions, but I think we need to be more, more curious than that. So, if getting the relationship with China right is central to our future prosperity, security, and well-being, why the disconnects? Why aren't we getting it right? I look at things on, on three levels. I think first, 
and this is fundamental, because Canadians are not willing to accept that things are changing. And polling, polling done by the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada shows a tremendous ambivalence about China, an ambivalence that is entirely understandable, but not particularly useful as the ultimate guide to, to policy determination. More to the point, the choice of engaging China or not engaging China is no longer entirely up to us. China is engaging us. It demands a smart response. And when I say that the government went silent after early 2012, I think it went silent largely because it was reading this growing ambivalence. China was moving quickly, suggesting things like free trade. We had the proposal by China National Offshore Oil Corporation, CNOC, to invest to take a controlling share in Nexon. Canadians felt that things were going too far, too fast. Again, not unreasonable views, but I think that was the time for a national debate to say, for a leader to say, the world is changing, China is offering us opportunities and challenges, we can't ignore what's happening, nor is it in, in our interest to ignore what's happening. We need a, a smart policy response, and here are some of the things we're considering. And that's not what we've had. And I'll come back to, to point to some examples in the past where we've risen to that kind of challenge. So Canadians are ambivalent. Canadians are worried. If you look at the Asia Pacific Foundation polling, only about 10% of Canadians have what they would refer to as a warm feeling about China. My second concern flows from my profound conviction that the Canadian Public Service is absent dynamic leadership at the very highest levels of government, ministers and above, that the public service is, without that, unequal to this challenge. When public servants talk about whole of government initiatives, they really mean policy as a sum total of what every department has on its wish list. When Ottawa talks strategy, it really means inventory. And, and I say this by invoking uh, the experience, and it was exhilarating and, and life-changing, but also painful, of uh, working on Afghanistan and, and working on our engagement in Kandahar. And I've got a lot of distinguished colleagues in the room who were part of that. And the, the fundamental challenge for many years in our engagement was, despite endless and boundless rhetoric about whole of government engagement, and despite having launched ourselves in a tremendously complicated and challenging mission in Kandahar, when you actually really did need to integrate your diplomacy globally with uh, a very generous aid program with whatever the Canadian forces wanted to do in, in Afghanistan, that had to be done in a Canadian, for a Canadian reason. We had instead three separate programs running along that tried their best not to bump into one another. And it was only in the intervention of the Manly Panel that brought about the, the change in, in governance, and that's often in Ottawa a kind of a boring and messy subject, but it brought about the change in governance that got us for a few years at least onto that coordinated track. And the central message that John Manley and his colleagues brought to the Prime Minister was that you, Prime Minister, have to own the mission in Kandahar and direct it from the very center of government if you want that kind of co coordination. Afghanistan was a very important uh, mission for us, but it is nowhere near the strategic importance of China. So um, there's a reason why uh, whole of government isn't working. And I get to the third and, and perhaps the most pressing concern, and it's the absence of, a, of a, what I see as the requisite leadership at the political level in Ottawa. I say in the book that um, I understand why domestic politics intrudes in foreign policy or is present in foreign policy. It's a natural thing in a democracy. It's not a bad thing. But it becomes a bad thing when it becomes the only consideration. And over the course of my career, I've seen it come to dominate more and more and more of our agenda, and certainly more of the agenda of leaders uh, when they travel overseas. Our endless fascination with Canadian politics leads, and, and I, I say this in the book, to a growing condition in Ottawa, in political Ottawa, that the rules that apply to the never-ending election campaign in Canada have a universal applicability, and everyone is as fascinated in our political process as we are ourselves. So we neglect the foreign in foreign policy and simply carry out in uh, Kunming the tactics and messaging that we would carry out in Kitchener. And I, I, I'm being a bit uh, irreverent here, but I actually think that's the truth. That or, and this is in some ways even more discouraging, that people at the political level understand the difference, but they don't really care. 
because for them, the never-ending election campaign is the priority. And we can always, in the future, deal with whatever inconveniences have been caused by whatever rhetorical excess or manhandling of senior Chinese people for a photo opportunity. The main thing is to get the picture. So we're moving farther from an enlightened ability to think about Canadian interests and manage them uh, accordingly. Now I talked about political leadership and interest in Canada's way in the world. And I mentioned uh, two examples on, on either side of the um, political divide. I mentioned the time that I was working in the Privy Council office as the Foreign and Defense Policy Advisor, and this was on Boxing Day the, of, I think, 2006, when uh, former President Gerald Ford passed away. And I got the call from the PMO switchboard and, and instructions to say, would you phone uh, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, a person who, despite the fact that we shared a last name I had never spoken to, would you phone him uh, at his vacation getaway and, and ask him to go and attend the funeral? So I did, and the PMO switchboard is a pretty remarkable um, uh, tool to have at your disposal. And the next thing I know, I hear that famous deep voice at the other end of the phone line and he readily agrees to attend the funeral and I make sure that the arrangements are in place and go on with with life. Two weeks later my assistant at PCO sticks her head in my office and says Brian Mulroney's on the phone. Now my brother's name is Brian Mulroney and I was trying to get in Ottawa at around four o'clock everyone's trying to get a memo finished I said I'm trying to get a memo finished tell him to wait. And, and she looked, she, she looked a little ashen and said, uh, no, it's the Brian Mulroney. So I picked up the phone and the voice, and, and he says, Mr. Mulroney? And I, and I said, no, no, you're Mr. Mulroney. And he then proceeds to list the three or four foreign policy priorities that Canada has, and then tell me what the five or six most important people at that event thought about those priorities and offer some, some ideas around potential impediments. And it was so complete that my, my writing arm was, was sore. And when he said, do you have any questions, I was embarrassed. I said, uh, no, I, I think I'm pretty good there, <laughs> Mr. Mulroney, thank you. And I wrote a brilliant briefing note afterwards, uh, <laughs> which I attributed to him. So I mentioned the book, for example, that Canadian and, and very principled Canadian activism uh, against apartheid was enabled by leadership and interest shown by an activist prime minister. Lots of Canadians were equally concerned, but in Canada, when leadership from the top meets grassroots activism, good things happen. The other example I mentioned is I, I, went, I was able to escape from Ottawa for three weeks to do a refresher course in Chinese before going to Beijing. I knew I had to get out because it's kind of like you know, the, the godfather. Once you try to get out, they, they pull you back. And so I wanted to get out of town, and I did. And I showed up at the language school, and I was very embarrassed. It had been 25 years since I'd studied Chinese, and I came with a big uh, dictionary under my arm. And they said, what's that? It's all online now. And I said, oh, I knew that. I was just you know, bringing this to show you what we used to use. Um, <laughs> anyway, so while I was there, I, I stopped, a, a, the only free time I had, I stopped at a second-hand bookstore, and I picked up a book that I'd often read about but never read, uh, Two Innocents in Red China. And so it's uh, Trudeau and Jacques Hébert and their 1960 visit to China. And I had the 1968 edition of the book, and in it is a note to the reader from Trudeau as Prime Minister. And it's a Trudeau as Prime Minister who's obviously thinking about next steps with China, and he jokes and banters in the intro in ways that no uh, political leader of the last 15 years just about anywhere would do, and in a very enlightened way. Um, but he also says, I, I, I thought I, I need to remind you uh, about why Jacques and I made this journey. And he said, let me quote a line from the original book. And he, he said, it seemed to us imperative that the citizens of our democracy should know more about China. So part of citizenship, part of growing up as a country is to be interested in the wider world and to try to understand it and to understand big important parts of it like China. And that seemed to me a pretty good prime ministerial, um, uh, uh, prime ministerial proclamation. So strong, self-confident leadership is what's needed if we're to convince Canadians about some of the challenges and some of the tough choices that lie ahead. I'd say, for example, things like the creation of an Asian infrastructure bank based in Shanghai and whether Canada should join or not is an example of those challenges, and it certainly isn't the only example that we're going to see in the coming future. 
So tough choices about ceding some space to China in global governance while striving to hold China to higher expectations uh, is certainly going to be uh, much more common for us. We're going to be challenged uh, in terms of where and when we stand up to China on important issues, a choice that will become increasingly fraught and costly. And I spend a chapter in the book talking about Canadian values and human rights and how often when I speak about human rights in Canada, I get a pretty angry response from some Canadians who'd say, who are we to lecture? Why should we lecture? And we, I talk about some of the reasons why it's, it's important to keep that as part of our conversation in China. Uh, I talked about the fact that there are lots of what I call constituencies of change in China, lawyers who want to be the best lawyers they can be and journalists who want to be the best journalists, for whom it's really important to know that other people care about those things too. The other reason is that a confident and capable China is increasingly able to take its arguments out into the international space. I was buttonholed by the ambassador of Fiji, a country not untroubled by human rights abuses, who told me we were at a function in Beijing thrown by the foreign ministry. And he said, um, you know what's great? Rise of China is great. He said, we used to have to listen to you and those pesky Australians and New Zealanders who, and Americans who were sanctioning us. Now we can completely ignore you and get on with business. And if you look at uh, Fiji's economy, you'll see that China plays a much larger role than it did 10 or 15 years ago. So we've got to have the backbone and self-confidence to take that debate to the wider international space and, and to engage China. Not to confront China or enrage China or to deal with them in such a way that the conversation ends, but we've got to have the conversation. Let me just close by saying a few things. If there's a subtext in the book, it's a book about the Foreign Service and it's a shout out to um, many of the colleagues that I see here, including Chef Roslin, who has a, a key part uh, early in the book and who became the star of our um, Twitter-like uh, feed, Weibo. She was way more popular than I was because she tweeted Canadian recipes and food products. And I'd go to Chinese universities and say, how many people are following Canada's uh, Weibo? And I'd see lots of hands go up. And I'd have mentioned about five or six times that I was a regular contributor. And I'd say, anybody in particular you follow? And then they'd say, Chef Roslin. So, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a shout out to the Foreign Service because I, I do a lot of talks in and around the GTA. And I, I um, meet people after the talks. And I'd find that increasingly people were coming up to me saying, I didn't know foreign service officers did all those things. I didn't know that they visited people in prison. I didn't know they promoted Canadian trade. I didn't know they stood up for human rights. And I talk about that and I tried to illustrate in the book the various things that foreign service officers do and try to introduce some of the people who do it. I want to say I worry that if we allow that institution and the larger public service to be shunted into the shadows, we participate or we acquiesce in Canadians forgetting about why those institutions are important, why they're fundamental to the success we've enjoyed uh, as a country and as a society. So there's a, in there a, a shout out as a, a, to, the, to the, the Foreign Service. And it's also about my own experience uh, as a public service. And I talk about, for example, uh, being a religious believer, a Catholic in China at a time when China decided again because it was feeling its oats at a time when the Vatican was trying to um, bring about a rapprochement with, with China when it decided to crack down on the church and on priests and bishops and how it was the first time in my personal experience as a very lucky Canadian in, from a prosperous society where all kinds of rights are, are tolerated and respected to live in that and, and that it gave me I think at least a small understanding of you know, the much larger challenges faced by Tibetan Buddhists and by uh, Uyghurs and, and other uh, ethnic and religious minorities in, in China. So I came away trying to report honestly on what's happening, hoping, hoping to provoke at least some discussion about why China is important and why we need to engage China with all of the tools in our inventory, including uh, a public service and a, and a foreign service. But I also came away feeling not discouraged, but strangely optimistic. And I came away feeling optimistic because as I wrote the book and thought about the book, I kept thinking about examples of Canadians in China. We're, we're all familiar with the example of Bethune, but there were two examples uh, of, of several that I mentioned in the book that I want to share with you is, and maybe to offer some in, insight into why I'm optimistic. Uh, about in the last two weeks of our posting, my wife Janet and I were rushing around uh, trying to you know, do inventories and prepare hand, no, hand over notes and do everything you have to do before you leave. But we also wanted to sneak away to see a couple of the things we'd never managed to see while we were in Beijing. One of them is the site where the fossil find Peking Man 
was discovered. Not surprisingly, it's just next to Beijing. And uh, so we, at the end of the day, got away, drove out to where the uh, you know, busy um, Beijing streetscape gives way to countryside and entered a very leafy park. And you know, I, I've said before that just as Navy SEALs are trained to do very complicated tasks, assemble heavy machinery at the bottom of a swimming pool and things like that, Canadian diplomats okay. learn to recognize references to Canada at a thousand meters from a speeding car <laughs> through a sandstorm. So we're going into uh, the Peking Man site and I see the pictures of the famous uh, uh, researchers and academics who, who helped to discover Peking Man and I see Someone, I see a reference to Canada, I'm sure. So I stop the car, go back and look. And I see there before me the story of Davidson Black. So Davidson Black was born in Toronto about 1890, uh, did his uh, undergraduate education in Canada, went on to the US. He was, uh, did his first degree in, in medicine but became um, an anthropologist and paleontologist, part of a team of people, including the you know, brilliant Jesuit Teilhard de Chardin, exploring the origins of early man. And he got himself a posting to uh, the, what is now Beijing University. And then it was a small college started by people like, I think, the Rockefeller Foundation. And so he was at the center of all these expeditions going out to discover things. And sure enough, a team comes with a molar, a tooth, found very close to Beijing. And they dig for more things. And Black is the, the person on the scene who says this is a significant step in the development of the human species and it's so significant that it deserves to be called Peking Man. So that's, that's a, a, a big contribution. But why the Chinese remember Black is that he also insisted, and there was a team of distinguished international academics, but Black insisted that Chinese researchers be part of the team, that they not take the bones and the molar back to Harvard or to Tokyo, that the research be done in China and that Chinese uh, paleontologists and anthropologists be developed and be part of this team. And the Chinese never forgot this. And then finally, he was so dedicated and so hardworking that he died at his desk. So he's fondly remembered in China, maybe less well known in Canada, but a great example. And the final example I'll cite is um, I made a trip uh, down to, and uh, David Bostwick is here, who will remember this, to Yunnan, and I had some business to do in Yunnan, but I also, and I, I admit this now, if there were certain things that interested me personally, I would try to sneak away at, on the weekend or in the afternoon to, to see that. And I'd read a book by an underground Chinese writer called Liao Yi Wu, and the book is called, he, he, this, Liao, Liao Yi Wu is, I, I, I'm not sure what his personal beliefs are, he's not a, I don't think he's a religious believer, but he wanted to write about these little pockets of, these thriving pockets of Christianity in Yunnan. He's always interested in the, the sort of underbelly of Chinese life, the, the, those who don't, who aren't prospering, who are struggling, the fighters. So he's interested in the Christians of Yunnan, and I was so fascinated by the book, I said, if we get a chance, I want to sneak away and try to meet a couple of these people, because I, I was interested in religious freedom. I want to understand what motivates them and what keeps them going. So one of the people I met was a, a nun who is one of the few people I've met, uh, people in China actually born in the Qing Dynasty. So she was born you know, before 1911, and she survived the Cultural Revolution and slept on the floor in front of her church, and just a, a feisty, remarkable person. But we also met an elderly couple. Woman was in her 80s, man was in his 90s, and they had both worked at a largely Canadian-run hospital, run by uh, Canadian Protestant missionaries, part of the larger China Inland Mission Service, uh, in the 1940s. And because of their association with Christians, because of their association with foreigners, they suffered greatly in the Cultural Revolution. And they'd never really you know, climbed to the top in Chinese society. They were in a very simple room, very poorly furnished, but they were very happy and very, very congenial hosts. And at one point they said, where are you from again? I said, Canada. And they said, you've got to know Jesse Mack. And I said, and now that's a pretty Canadian name, but I said, I, I'm not sure I do. Now I found out that Jesse Mack was a woman who did her medical studies uh, in university in Canada in 1905. So our academic careers didn't connect <laughs> exactly. Um, but so she's a pioneering woman who's studying medicine, she's one of four women in a class of 400 at U of T. She goes off to join the China Inland Missions, suffers in the chaos of the Japanese invasion, ultimately is forced out of China, but instead of coming back to Canada, she sails around, comes back into Yunnan, 
then even more remote, much more difficult to live in. And in her 60s is building clinics and trekking off into the hills to check on the wealth, uh, the, uh, the well-being of the, the various uh, indigenous peoples who live up in the hills in that part of Yunnan and stayed on to be the last person working in that mission when the Chinese take over and paint slogans on the, the wall of the mission. And, and you know, uh, the, the story about her is that she left town, she stopped and she rang the bell in the church one last time and then made her way back to, to the West. But what struck me about the story was these people remembered her with an enthusiasm and a, an affection as if she just left the room. She was someone who had made a huge difference and in thinking about her and, and Davidson Black, I got to thinking about you know, their pragmatism, their very flat, democratic, absolutely non-colonial approach to, to the world and to life, and their abiding love for China and things Chinese. And this is something I kept coming across again and again and again. And I say Bethune is a very famous example of that, but there are many in our history. And when I thought about it, I thought these aren't just sort of consigned to history they're quintessentially Canadian uh, characteristics, and they're what we need to call on, I think, if we're to rise to the challenge that China represents. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're lucky David uh, ha does have time to answer some questions. We have just about a half an hour. So let me just... Um, remind you of our house rules and David is going to be calling the questions himself but do we have floating mics the one two okay good so we are recording the session so when he calls on you just wait a moment for one of the microphones to be passed to you please please identify yourself and then here's the big one please keep your question relatively short no big long speeches please uh, I deputize you to uh, be the bad guy call for a question if somebody starts a speech but I'll leave it to okay. you to call your, call your question thank you thank you Roland yes thank you thank you so much for for the book first of all I haven't read it yet but I will I promise <laughs> my name is Vasily Kultyshev I'm third secretary at uh, the Russian Embassy in Ottawa yes. and my question is like on a bigger scale what do you think of BRICS that's it. Thanks. So BRICS, um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and, and the S that is on sometimes South Africa. Um, you know, honestly, uh, we had a slide, and, and this was a very self-serving slide from the embassy in Beijing, which we called a BRIC buster, because I think <laughs> BRICS is a convenient acronym, but it actually obscures more than it communicates, because they're, they're very different members, uh, and, and BRICS is often thought of in economic terms, but uh, in raw economic size and power and trajectory, China stands very different from the other BRICs. And in terms of engagement with Canada, if Canada is to think of the BRICs. And so one of the reasons I was frustrated, and it's not that I don't respect the individual BRICs, they're all very important countries, but sometimes in, in uh, the Pearson Building, headquarters of foreign affairs and international trade and now development, um, just as I said, they have, people have trouble strategizing it's not that because they don't like to strategize. So just as you'd say, let's we need to think about China, someone would say, but we need a BRIC strategy instead. And so then they'd step back and further back and, and designing a strategy for that includes uh, a Brazil and a South Africa, not to mention a Russia and an India as well as a China, looks very big and cumbersome. And we come back to a stat that showed that just as China is not anywhere close to being as important to us economically as the U.S. is. Many Canadians are still surprised to see that it is a very significant number two. And in fact, it is larger in economic terms, in, in, in import-export terms, than uh, the next ones, uh, UK, Germany, Japan, uh, and France added together. And it's growing faster than they are. So sometimes, I'm not sure that it, in a Canadian uh, perspective, it, it's as useful to, uh, to conceptualize in terms of the BRICs. And I think we're seeing a little bit of restiveness among the individual BRIC members. They're not, not all the same. There are some other groupings, and I, I think the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is another one that's worth watching. Certainly the multilateral world, the world of organizations is changing, and the challenge for Canada will be to decide you know, which ones, where, and when. My own focus would, cause, and it's my prejudice being a, an Asia-focused person, but I think there's some groups in, in Asia that we have to get a little bit closer to first, including ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian 
uh, nations and some of the things there. So I, I'm, I'm less of a brick believer than others. Thanks. I'm going to go to this side and then back. So one and two. Uh, you, sir. Hi, David. How are you oh, doing? Good to see you. <laughs> um, I just, quick question. I don't want to put you on the spot or anything. Well, from then, let's forget it then. No. <laughs> Kevin. I know I just may be a little sensitive about your successor, but just curious, you know, a couple of years ago, there was this sort of, you know, there was a played out in the Globe and Mail, this question of, oh, you know, I mean, will the government appoint, have a political appointment as your successor? And curious to get your views on sort of the, the relative benefits and costs of that. So having a sort of public service or foreign service appointment versus a political appointment I mean, in a relationship that, as you say, is, is so important to Canada going forward. It's, it, 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 this always, the danger is this becomes kind of ad hominem and, you know, it, it shouldn't be that. I mean, first of all, I'm a professional, I was a professional foreign service officer, so my loyalties are to the professional foreign service. I think there are some postings where uh, a, a gifted political person can make a real difference, but they tend to be in places that are not like China. China is a place where government matters and people who understand governments and work with governments uh, quite naturally uh, are much better than, than sort of freewheeling political commentators. They're better, I think, in places like, like Washington, maybe, or Los Angeles, or uh, often in places where uh, the, the rules are a little bit uh, looser and allow, they allow the, the larger-than-life political officers more scope to, or, or political people more scope to operate. I think in China you actually need uh, a, a professional diplomat, and I, I talk about, and I, you know, the, the, there was some play about uh, being critical of uh, Minister Baird for largely ignoring the advice of the, or ignoring the people from foreign affairs who traveled with him, focusing more on the Chinese ambassador. And I did say those things, and I, and I thought long and hard before saying them because it, uh, I didn't like to say them, but I think I had to say them. The reason I said them is because um, Chinese ambassadors and Chinese diplomats are very professional. And they're always on, and I, you know, I, I've talked about how, you know, at one point you're, you have a very sunny, rosy meeting with someone, and the next day if they're mad at Canada, it's an entirely different person, and you wouldn't believe that you had the conversation the day before. So there's always an agenda. Uh, cards are held close to the vest, and it takes a long time to learn how to operate in that environment. So I think it's better to have diplomats, and ideally diplomats who've served some time in China serving in senior positions in China. But I, I also uh, acknowledge that I, you know, there, there, there are people out there who could prove me wrong, but I think generally you're safer going with, uh, with public service experience. And I'm going to go here and then back. Uh, David, Bruce Montador, yes, uh, Bruce, yeah. senior fellow here, but formerly Canadian executive director at the African Development Bank, yes. where I was also, and maybe many of you may not know this, the Chinese executive director, because Canada represents China at the African Development Bank. Uh, and, and a long time before that, I was in finance during the Asian financial crisis. So my question, which I was going to ask you, and you raised it, actually, you're interested, is on the Asian Infrastructure Bank, where actually Jin Li Chun, who was my opposite number in the Chinese foreign finance ministry when, during the Asian crisis, is the, the chairman of it. And what's interesting is there's been no public discussion. They're all about the Brits upsetting the Americans and then all the Europeans. And I haven't seen anything suggesting that we should join, which I think would be a very good idea. But I would be interested in your reaction to that. This is playing out as things shouldn't play out from a Canadian perspective. And it's playing out that way um, because we're not having the kinds of conversations that we need to have with like-minded countries about what's important to us, how the world should work. Not anti-China conversations, not ganging up on China, but conversations that prevent us from being split off the way the Europeans have in such an unseemly way been split off. And I, yeah, I, I don't mean to cast aspersions, but uh, British policy recently on issues ranging from Tibet to Hong Kong has been pretty soft and that Britain led the, uh, the, the scramble, the European scramble into the bank, I think is, is unfortunate. There are real concerns about establishing a parallel financial institutions, so whether we need it, in a place where uh, transparency in, in financial services is still a long way off and where rule of law is incomplete. It was ironic and not connected, and people have a tremendous habit of not connecting things on China. China gets a free pass on a lot of things. That, As people were discussing this rush to entry, it was also announced that uh, the website for Reuters, you know, the, the European shining light on all things financial, was closed down in China. That's not a really good basis on which to, to get started. There is a tendency, and I talk about this in the book, 
for us to treat China as if it's already behaving the way we want it to behave. And we hope that that means that China will feel so guilty it will behave that way. And it doesn't always work out that way. So I actually think, and let me say one other thing. While I agree with the Americans, they are largely the authors of their own misfortune because Congress has been hung up and they haven't uh, approved the, the, the fairer voting rights for China in the existing international institutions. So that's a total mess. But if I was Canada, I'd do three things. One, I'd go and talk to the Americans because we're good at reminding them when we disagree with them. We're terrible at letting them know, and they're very preoccupied and they'll often pat us on the head, but you actually have to grab them by the lapels when you're doing something that accords with their thinking and say, we are actually doing what you, know, you want to do. So here, here's a point of convergence. Second thing I do is I put this on the agenda of something like the, the G7. Um, other people have talked about the D10. Do we need a group of democracies? We need a place where we can talk with like-minded countries about what we value in multilateral institutions, what the bottom, you know, what our, our, our basic expectations are, and how we should behave together. I have, I'm not really optimistic that we can bind the Europeans in those discussions, but they have to start. And the third thing I do is, uh, I, someone asked me earlier today, what about currying favor with China? And I said, if you're the last one into the bank, which we'd be at this stage, there's not much favor to curry. So even if we wanted to follow our baser motives, this isn't the time to do it. But I'd actually think about what would it cost us to be in the bank? What resources would be put behind it? And instead, why don't we put it into other programming? Let, let's use this as an object lesson. We'll file this away for the future. And let's get involved in, directly in Asia. There's no, we shouldn't be stampeded into the view that the only way we can have credibility in, in, in Asia is through this Chinese bank. And finally, why is it that almost all of the discussion about joining the bank is based on whether it will be seen as friendly by Beijing or not? If that's the reason we're joining the bank, it's the wrong reason. Anyway, that's... Uh, yes, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, I'm, I'm Natalie Brender. I'm an associate with the center here. Um, in a number of the excerpts of your book I've read in the paper recently, you got to read the whole thing. I will absolutely read the whole thing. And sorry if my question is already answered in your book. Um, in a number of places, you, you have some fairly harsh words to say about the way in which recent Canadian foreign policy, policy to China has been driven by considerations of appealing to the Chinese diaspora in Canada as political voters at home. Um, I wonder if you see any potentially positive ways in which Canadian foreign policy could be drawing on the Chinese diaspora in Canada, um, either by the diplomats or by the political level, or are you inclined to think really it's not a wise tactic for dealing with China to be drawing on the diaspora in Canada at all for the time being? Um, that's another part of the book that I thought long and hard about writing. And, it's, and by the way, I make the point that this wasn't invented by the current government, uh, although I think it's being it's being increased. And the examples I used and, and pointed to were the increasing tendency to recruit missions around senior people, and particularly the prime minister, along ethnic lines. And in China, some things like uh, suggestions by political staffers that MPs of Chinese origin might be the interpreters at events. Now, and I, I was able to squelch that, but the idea being it makes a cute news clip back home but it doesn't impress people in China. Chinese people are impressed when MPs act like MPs. And the most impressive thing about Canada is it's not a big deal for us. We don't think about MPs as being Chinese MPs or Ukrainian MPs. We think of them as being MPs. That's what makes Canada special. That's what we should put in the shop window. You know, they know that the leader of China knows that there's a large diaspora in Canada, and, and the, I'm not sure what they think about that because there are large Chinese diasporas in many places. China tends to be uh, rather, uh, you know, sort of unsentimental about its international diasporas. And I think it should be up to people themselves. There are lots of times when, you know, if you're promoting education or tourism, the fact that Canada is diverse and multicultural and indeed has a large uh, a population of people of Chinese origin, where that's, a, that's an advantage. But when you see the leader of China or the leader of India, normally the bilateral meeting is 40 minutes. And if there is interpretation, that means 20 minutes. And then you split that in half. You only have so many things to talk about. And they want to talk about some other things, too. Finally, a country like China is also not averse to interfering in, in Canada. And in a certain, to a certain extent, we sometimes indicate to them that we have these large politically sensitive groups and it's almost an invitation to interfere. It should be completely up to 
Canadians of Chinese origin whether they wish to participate in the relationship or not, but we shouldn't assume that they somehow have a responsibility to lead in it. We need to grow up and we need to treat everybody in Canada as a Canadian first and foremost. And if they choose to remember their roots, that's great and we welcome that, but it's up to them, not up to the government. That, that would be my view. Yes. And then we'll go back. Hi, Ailish Campbell with yes. the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. Our organization is in favor of a free trade agreement with China, but more as a process uh, and a journey to an ultimate destination. Um, our members have, some of them have been in China for more than five decades. I think the key to moving the Canadian dialogue on an FTA forward is engaging small and medium-sized enterprises. So as the former ambassador, I'm very interested in the advice you gave to small and medium-sized enterprises particularly, and specifically on issues like intellectual property. Thanks. Yeah, um, we would spend a lot of time with uh, small, and I, I got to know uh, a little bit about Canadian SMEs, small and medium enterprises in China when I worked with the Canada-China Business Council, because about I, I took three years out of government and worked with the CCBC, and about 60% of our members were SMEs. My main takeaway from them, I also learned about them when I worked for Dwayne Wright in the East Asia Trade Division of uh, Foreign Affairs back in the early, uh, er, the late 1980s. But um, one of the things that I remembered was you know, what, how expensive it is for small and medium-sized companies to develop a market like China. And, and people in government are always lecturing them, saying, you know, why are you so focused on the U.S.? I remember, this was in China, but when I worked in Malaysia, helping a company to win a contract uh, providing uh, services to the emergency medical system around Kuala Lumpur. And it took him, you know, about five visits, and we, got, we, we helped. And he said, I said, aren't you happy? He said, I'm very happy, but he said, my colleague just got a similar contract in Michigan based on one drive across the border. So to a certain extent, you have to cut companies a little slack. And I know the world is changing and there are fewer contracts in Michigan and more in, in Kuala Lumpur, I guess, as we go forward. But thinking about cost is important. What can we do to help bring down cost? So I think the ultimate, uh, I think ultimately it's something like a free trade agreement would probably be a good thing as long as we negotiate a good one. But in the meantime, how do you make it easier for companies to learn about China? How do you create opportunities for them to network in Canada with other companies that have been active? Uh, one of the most encouraging things I saw when I was in China was the growth of you know, Canadian banks and law firms and business advisors who can advise on things like intellectual property protection. That's still a huge problem, but it is less of a problem, as you know, depending on where you are geographically, you're more likely to get a fair shake in a Shanghai or Beijing than you are perhaps in, in other jurisdictions. So the, the law is being applied selectively in some places, so helping people to find out where that is, helping them to minimize risk is important. And the other thing I talk about is engagement by subnational governments in Canada. And I saw some premiers and some mayors do a tremendously effective job of helping their exporters. I make the point, and this is after having been exposed to the Team Canada process, I became less and less convinced that the Prime Minister should be the main trade promoter. I think there are real, there's a real downside to that. But there's no reason why a Premier or a Mayor or a Minister can't be. So uh, I, I saw uh, some very effective work by people like the Mayor of Vancouver, the Mayor of Calgary, uh, the Mayor of Ottawa, the Mayor of Waterloo, not so much in the last couple of years, uh, surprisingly, the mayor of Toronto, and, and his staying home was probably a good thing. But the good news is that John P Tory and, and um, uh, uh, Kathleen Wynne are both more interested. Why subnational units of government are interesting and can help SMEs is there's still a kind of a rough reciprocity in China. So if you're part of a mission led by a mayor or a premier, you'll often get a chance, the Chinese are very good at recruiting the people who come to the events based on who's on the Canadian delegation. And it often gives smaller Canadian companies a chance to meet counterparts that it would take them five or ten visits to, to China to, to get to meet. So the smart use, and certainly the Americans and the Europeans are very, very good at this. So the use of um, subnational governments, um, the growth of business advisors, including Canadian business advisors in China, is helpful. The, 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 the spreading ecosystem of respect for rule of law in China, which is still imperfect, but it is much larger than when I was there, these are all good things, and I remain convinced that there's still a significant role for, for government in helping business in China, but we've just got to be careful about what level and, and who. Thank you. Uh, I saw the, the gentleman right there with me. You. Yes, sir. 
and then we'll go one back. <laughs> okay. Hi, Michael Lombard, PhD student at the Sorbonne Doctoral College and University of Tampere in Finland. My question will be more like on Ukraine. When you just look at the current situation, the European Union, United States and Canada are trying to put some pressure on Russia, but it's obviously not working very well. Don't you think that it would be very nice to improve the relationship with China in order to have the Chinese people put some pressure on the Russian side in order to solve the conflict? Or did you have a strategy about it? I, What do you think about it, at least? There, there's always been um, a, a, a great hope that China would be, uh, and it was described once as, uh, you know, a responsible stakeholder and play a larger role in international affairs. There's a very hopeful piece in the New York Times today suggesting that China is actually playing a behind-the-scenes role on negotiations between uh, the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan with help from Pakistan. I'm a little skeptical about that, but uh, if, it, if it's happening, I, I, I applaud that. Um, it would be nice if China were to play a role like that, but I think, and I, I talk about this in the book, I think China is still quite conflicted, and there's still a tendency, uh, first, the, the absolute value that China attaches to the, the doctrine of non-interference should be helpful, but at the same time, I think China is also tempted by anything that confounds the West and the United States in particular. So it's going to take a little while, and it's no reason not to try, and it's exactly why we should engage China. It's going to take a little while to, to get China to play, I think, a, a, a more fully responsible and less narrow role in the world in terms of hard politics and security. Where we might start, though, are in other areas, and I'm, that's an area where I think Canada is falling down. That's the environment. It's very easy to criticize China, and China is a source of pollution, and in many ways it, it, the, the pollution has to be seen to be believed. It's got huge environmental problems. But China is actually moving in terms of its approach uh, on environmental policy in very, very interesting ways. And uh, smart countries, and I was a little critical of the UK earlier, but the UK devotes a lot of its diplomacy to working with China on issues of environmental policy, largely for very self-interested British, British reasons. We've been much less active for some obvious Canadian reasons, and I, I make the point that, for example, on the issue of oceans, we spent more time um, trying to sell seal meat than we did talking about sustainability and, and uh, a, a more environmentally sound approach to managing the, the global fish stocks. So. There are lots of ways to start working with China. China is already being helpful in some respects, but I think hard security and politics is probably uh, a couple of steps down the line. And yes, sir, the gentleman behind. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, my name is Peter McKinnon. I'm in the Faculty of Engineering here. And I've actually spent some time as a business advisor in China, living there in Shanghai. So my question is about the future. Uh, I'm just wondering what you see in regard to uh, China and Canada with respect to the Arctic, especially uh, both in terms of the environment, the use of, and resources of the ocean, and uh, trade. China is thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, China is keenly interested in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. And I think that has to do with um, one, uh, a sense that uh, there are probably significant natural resources there that China doesn't want to be shut out of exploiting to a certain extent. And two, because I, I, I think there's a great sense in China that if there are important global clubs, China has to belong to all of them, including clubs relating to the Arctic and to the Antarctic. And so they've built or are building uh, icebreakers for the Arctic and, and the very different ones required for the Antarctic, and they're spending a lot of money on research in both places. We've been uh, standoffish in terms of the Arctic for a number of reasons, and, and some of them are not unfounded. It concerns about you know, China's uh, ulterior motives. Um, China's, also, China's effort has also been somewhat frustrated, although not completely, by its uh, belligerence towards Norway. Because Norway, or because the Nobel Committee uh, awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace to Liu Xiaobo, uh, China in a very pe petulant way, in a fit of pique, has been uh, uh, harming, or has been uh, giving Norway the cold shoulder for some time. To the extent that now you see sales of Scottish salmon in China have ro are, are rising and sales of Norwegian salmon are declining. So missing an opportunity to, to really develop ties with the, the Norwegians. At the end of the day, uh, I think that China's interest is unstoppable. Uh, China will find ways to get involved, in, whether it's for navigation or resource exploitation. 
and it's probably worth our while to sit down and cooperate with them uh, to talk about what our concerns are in the Arctic. Uh, and this was something, uh, as much as I'm worried about some Chinese investment in the southern Canada, I'm much more in worried about their interest in the Arctic and uh, environmental issues. But this is precisely why uh, we should be talking to them instead of not talking to them. And there are areas, and it's always wonderful to find this, where we actually learn a lot from the Chinese who are, you know, when they take an interest in things, uh, spend a lot of time and deploy a lot of people to taking an interest in them. So uh, I think China's interest will only grow, their ambitions will only grow, and it's better to be talking to them than, than not talking to them, and in including them in things like the Arctic Council. I so, okay. Yes, sir. Oh. David Burke. I was a former defense attaché in Beijing. Uh, I would like to have you address the issue of security in Northeast Asia and the relationship particularly between Japan and China. Could you talk for a few minutes about that, please? Uh, I think that relationship is one, and I, I, I talk in the book a little bit about our focus on the Ukraine, which I think is a, a serious problem, and the Middle East, which is an even more serious problem, but a tendency not to be as interested in what's happening in um, the Western Pacific uh, off um, Japan and, and China, which I think is dangerous. Maybe a little bit less dangerous than it was even six months ago, but still uh, very dangerous. And I mean, there are varying schools of thought on um, why this has happened. Certainly to a large extent, I think it has to do with uh, the incompleteness of uh, Japan's apologies and uh, atonement for the terrible damage it inflicted on China, the terrible human suffering it inflicted on China in a, in a war that went from the mid-30s until 1945. So that's, that can never be forgotten. But it also has a lot to do with China's very selective use of Japan as uh, a whipping boy and as a distraction. So China is currently encouraging people to come to a parade to celebrate the anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And in so doing, reminding people in China of all these grievances. But its memory is much more selective when it comes to things like uh, the man-made famine uh, of the Great Leap Forward, the chaos of the Cultural Revolution, the tragedy of Tiananmen. So when countries start playing with history like that, the effects are always dangerous. But China's thinking, uh, so, so some people say that you know, by 2008, 2009, the world is telling China it can do no wrong. China begins to believe this, and we see a new assertiveness in Chinese policy. And just as soon as that school of thought uh, appeared, uh, a different school of thought appeared that said, no, this is completely standard. And, uh, but I, I, I believe that um, China was becoming more assertive. And certainly uh, pushing out against Japan and disputing these islands that are either the tail end of the Japanese archipelago or uh, a piece of uh, uh, islands off the coast of China, um, it also began uh, pressing against the Philippines and um, very aggressively enveloping islands that had previously been claimed by the Philippines and also pressuring Vietnam. But China's ultimate objective is to cause the United States and the US Navy to lose the confidence to operate the way it has operated in, uh, that, on that side of the Pacific. So uh, there is a more aggressive posturing by China there's a lot of talk about you know, access denial technologies, technologies that would make it impossible for, for the US to operate its carrier fleets uh, as close to China as it has in the past. Uh, technologies like cruise missiles that can strike carriers. So the ultimate objective is a bit of saber rattling uh, with the, the Americans themselves. Where this gets really dangerous is when you consider, and, and the establishment of a, 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 an air defense zone uh, off China that requires commercial airliners to file flight plans with the Chinese, something that the US and Japanese air forces promptly ignored. But what you, ha what you have now is a series of navies operating in very, very close proximity. Chance for error is always significant. And in many ways, the most worrying outcome uh, could be a clash between China and Japan that China loses because Japan is still technologically superior 
and that leads to further Chinese humiliation and even more dire consequences. In the absence of any kind of security infrastructure where they can sit down and talk about these things, uh, makes it very, very difficult to get to the bottom, as does, and I have to come back to this, a continuing uh, Japanese stubbornness uh, in terms of things having to do with uh, a, a war that's now very long ago. So it's, it, it really is uh, very worrying. Although there was an interesting article in um, a, a magazine called The Diplomat, which focuses a lot on uh, defense issues, where somebody said that the approach to the Chinese Navy of today, the way the US Navy sees the Chinese Navy, is the way that the Royal Navy and the French Navy thought of the Italian Navy in the late 1930s. And in fact, they designed the wrong strategy for an enemy that was never as formidable as they feared, and that caused them to, to make even more serious mistakes. So um, I always worry a little bit when some of the people who are most worried about uh, Chinese technology are people like the US Navy who have a stake in building <laughs> carriers and more ships. But I think we're seeing a very different China, and there's reason to be worried about the Western Pacific. Yes, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this very enlightening uh, presentation. Um, I think it was Casey Stengel that said that predictions are always difficult, except, especially about the future. Um, and I'd like to ask you for a little crystal ball about uh, where China's going, if you, if you could. Um, if you look at our other big partners, and maybe this is one reason why that some Canadians are hesitant about dealing with China, uh, the European Union in 20 years will be a democracy, thriving economy, not no, light, no doubt, maybe bigger. The United States will continue to be a thriving democracy with a, an expanding economy. Where will China be in 20 or 10 years? Um, are we going to face the fact that uh, the world's largest economy is uh, under an authoritarian state? Um, these are questions I think that people are sort of uh, trying to mull through as they approach China. And I'm not sure if it's dealt with in your book or not. I don't get into too much crystal ball gazing, but I talk about a couple of um, trends that, if not addressed, could lead to instability in China. And there's a, a very distinguished China watcher named David Shamba at the George Washington University who just wrote a piece on the coming you know, collapse of China that's been very controversial and generated a lot of, of heat. Uh, even Shamba, though, saying you know, he thinks that there will be, we're seeing the beginning of the end game. Uh, allows himself, you know, uh, 10 years or more for this to play out. I think a couple of things are, are evident now. One is that the current President Xi Jinping has, has sort of defied uh, most confident expectations of two or three years ago when people said, well, the one thing we can be sure of in terms of the Chinese leadership is it'll be more consensus-based and the era of a, a powerful single leader is behind us. Of course, Xi Jinping is uh, powerful and authoritative and has succeeded very quickly in putting his stamp on much of the you know, machinery of government in China. He's clearly in charge. And he's also been very forceful in promoting his vision of you know, the, the Chinese dream, the, the great renewal of the Chinese nation. And he's not afraid to reach back into Chinese history. Most, many people uh, have been comfortable with the divide in Chinese history that says, in modern Chinese history, that says there was a revolutionary part that was you know, um, exemplified by uh, Mao and uh, Deng Xiaoping is a, so there's the revolutionary early years and that were heroic but also very chaotic and included the Cultural Revolution and then you had a transitional figure like Deng Xiaoping who ushered in this area of economic progress. So people were happy about sort of shutting off that revolutionary chaotic part into the past. She is not afraid to reach into the past and invoke some of the feelings and some of the patriotic energy that that, uh, that brings with it. So it's, these are, are different times. Um, I do think, and, and this is where uh, I think Shamba, David Shamba's critique comes into play, what China, has, what, what China has done essentially is try to put off perpetually some fairly existential questions about the nature of, or the relationship between the people of China and the government of China. And they would like to put off forever the question of what is the relationship and the accountability of the government and the Chinese Communist Party to its people. And this is most acute when you think of things like uh, questions of rule of law. There's a lot of interest in some kind of the possibility of uh, some kind of legal reform in China. But the ultimate question of is the party the font of the law and therefore forever above the law, forever newly creating it, 
or is it subject to the law? The fact that China hasn't addressed this, I think, is uh, marks an inevitable point of you know crisis and contention in the future. It's, it, 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 it's a point that they, the party itself cannot forever put off. President, President Xi Jinping is involved in a major crackdown on corruption against the tigers and flies in Chinese society. It's very popular, but it's probably going to have to be very limited because it can't come close to his own power structure in China. And I think ultimately the failure of the party, the inability of the party to engage in the kind of reform that would actually see its own rule and legitimacy challenged will mean that China is laying up uh, problems for the future. Problems that will be exacerbated by the effects of demographic <coughs> decline, significant environmental problems. We tend to see an all-powerful China, but from, the chi from China looking out, you see a China that's beset with significant problems. She's having a short, a good run in the short term, and he's putting the lie to people. He's he's doing a kind of a Lee Kuan Yew of you know uh, the benign authoritarian rule. Uh, I don't think that's that's a long game. I don't think he's got as long as Lee Kuan Yew had. Nor do I think China is Singapore. So uh, my own sense is that within five to ten years, we will see an increasing degree of instability in China that can be dealt with if the party is willing to engage, even at this late stage, in meaningful uh, political reform. And I don't mean declaring elections tomorrow, but I mean getting back to the business of building democracy from, from the grassroots, not forestalling discussions about empowering people and institutions. But if they don't do that, uh, within five to ten years, we'll see, uh, I think, significant instability. Me to uh, thank David Mulroney for today's event. Um, as I was listening to your analysis, David, it struck me just how um, informed and balanced and sophisticated it is. And the thought was going that was going through my head was how rarely we hear informed and balanced and sophisticated analysis of uh, Canada-China relations. Your uh, comments here, and I'm sure in your book, which I repeat is on sale uh, outside the room, uh, include a number of not just observations, but cautions um, that um, I think deserve to be heeded. Um, and um, the, the fact that you have such a large number of people interested in hearing you speak, including so many people that you've worked with before, I think is a reflection of the respect uh, that you have uh, among uh, your peers and among those who have worked for you, and um, and it's evident why. Uh, so uh, let me just say again, thank you uh, for uh, your your public service, for your ongoing public service, and I think we all look forward to uh, reading the book and hearing more from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you.